Welcome to Smoky CNC Woodworks. I'm Brian, and today I'm going to cover two of the things I get asked the most when I get private messaged and emails and even some comments. One of which is, Who am I? I just started doing YouTube and I never talked about myself, where I'm at, or anything. Uh, my name's Brian McGill. I live in South Central Oklahoma. I work for the Highway Patrol here. For a short time longer, I've actually got over 19 years on, and in March of next year, I will retire. Even more exciting than that, the middle of next month, being in the middle of December, I start vacation, take extended leave, and I don't come back until I retire. That's pretty exciting to me. So then I hope to focus more on doing CNC full-time. My wife and I have two other businesses. Uh, one's called Get Right Designs. It's an apparel business, the screen printing, embroidery, it's a boutique. Uh, you can find her on Instagram and Facebook with her stuff. I haven't talked her into doing YouTube yet. Uh, the other business we have is JBM RV and Boat Storage. And it's just like it says, it's an RV and boat storage down by Arbuckle Lake. We've got 100 units. And so those are our two other sources of income. The second question I get asked about most is, how did I build it? So today that's what we're covering. I'm going to go over this thing front to back, how I built this machine, and basically just give you an overview of it. I'm not going to go into all the workings of all the parts, but I will explain what all I've got here, how I did it, and I will insert some pictures that I took along the way when I was building it. I didn't video it, but I did take pictures as it was going. So let's get to it. We're just going to start right here with the frame. My posts are 3 to 3 square tubing connected with 1.5 by 3 inch rectangular tubing, top and right down here about a third of the way down. Uh, that's basically, uh, this reason I went with steel is because it's something I had readily available. I already had these posts, the corner posts. I just had to come up with the cross members, which was 1.5 by 3. Uh, the reason I went with such a wide one is because of my linear rails. I didn't have to worry about spacing. I didn't have to be perfect when I placed them because all I had to do was get my parallel distance, place them, and if on the top of this, if they were moved one way or the other, I had room to play. I didn't want something that was exactly the same width as my rail because then I, I had no tolerance whatsoever. So, I mean, I, I like to have just a little bit of tolerance, so if I need to move it someplace, I can. Uh, the frame, like I said, is all steel underneath. When I went, did my cross members across, it tied this side, which is a mirror to the other side. I tied it with, in four places at the end, at the opposite end, and then two right here in the middle. One there and one right here. They go all the way across. They are four foot wide and it is four foot long. Okay, in between my posts on both ends, we are 49 inches from inside to inside. I did that because I was having a 48 inch table. I did not want to struggle getting my tabletop in and out of here. This thing's fairly heavy. My top is constructed of a 2 by 4 frame right here in the middle. Down at the bottom I've got it closed in with a piece of quarter inch plywood, a piece of three quarter inch plywood, and then on top up here my waste board is MDF, medium density fiber board. Okay, I hope I don't make you guys sick here carrying the camera around, but it just wasn't working very well on the tripod. I couldn't get in here close enough so y'all could see what I'm talking about. So we're going to try it this way. So right here on my table, I told you I have MDF up here. I do it this way because I, if I mess up a section with my router, I can take a six inch section and replace it. And it's fairly cheap to do this way. In between my sections here, you can see I've got some railing in there. That's called T-Track. T-Track is what my little clamps run on. You can see that it's got a T-bolt in it. That and that, I wish I would have gone with all larger style, like this big one back here. If I buy more, I will be buying the bigger ones. I do like them better. They're easier to handle. The, little, the knob's just easier to mess with because it's bigger. 
These are from Rockler. I got these off of Amazon. I'll be leaving a link for anything that I point out, the T-Track, the clamps, any of the parts I point out, I'll leave links to where I got them from off of Amazon. 98% of what I bought for this machine came from Amazon. So now we're going to go on up here and we're going to look at some other components. This is the linear rail. This is three quarter inch rail. Stainless steel on top, mounted on an aluminum base. It is four foot long. It comes with two of these linear glides. You can see that one there, the other one further back there. These are mounted to a piece of half inch by seven inch by eight inch aluminum plate. I ordered one big aluminum plate that was eight inches wide and cut them down and made them my glide plates. Those are just bolted to the uh, linear glides. Next to it is the ball screw. Ball screw is basically just a big fancy bolt. I mean it is huge. This thing is five foot long, five, eight inch, five eighths of an inch wide diameter. It goes through. It has its own glide right up under these there that also hooks into my aluminum plate. That has ball bearings in it that allow this thing to sit here and as this turns it drives it down the track here. Very smooth, limited backlash. I recommend the ball screw. I'm very pleased with it. It is more expensive than the other options. There are other linear glides out there that are cheaper but I just can't imagine them working better than these do. Here where they hook in, this is a pillow block. It has ball bearings. We'll look at the other end at that. The uh, pillow block down here, you can see where the rod actually comes through and inside there is just a ball bearings that just are pressed inside this little pillow block. So as it turns, it turns this block very smoothly, very smooth. So then it comes on down here and another little part you have to buy are these little couplers. Again, these came off Amazon. They go down from a, uh, I want to say that's 5 8 inch on one end. Ended up going down, necking down to a 3 8 inch on the end of the rod right there. So you have to just be real careful with that stuff. Clamps down on it. It is hooked into a 34 NEMA stepper motor. 34 is, uh, NEMA is a little bit bigger than what you're going to see on your average machines. Most machines are going to have a NEMA 23. Uh, it's quite a bit smaller, but, or I should say these are quite a bit larger than what most machines have. My biggest fear was, since I was building it out of steel, everything out of steel, it was going to be so heavy that that smaller motor may really struggle and I may burn them up. So I just went ahead and upgraded to the bigger one. And this is more than enough power. I mean, these things don't struggle a bit to slide it. I probably could have got away with the NEMA 23, but as you'll find throughout this whole process, I way overbuild. That's, I don't just always have. I like for things not to struggle, and if I want to do something a little bigger than what I probably should be doing, the machine will handle it. Okay, so I've got four NEMA 34s here. This is your Y-axis your x-axis which goes left to right I have another one over there on another on your y-axis so I have dual drive on the y-axis because it moves this great big gantry which is also two pieces of inch and a half by three rectangular tubing with two four foot linear rails on it and it also has mounted on it a ball screw that goes across to the other end of the gantry in the middle You've got the Z-axis, which is going to be your spindle. You can see right there, there's another ball screw, and there's another linear rail. This linear rail, however, is 5 8 inch uh, diameter, and this is a half inch ball screw. That particular piece, I did not build. All this aluminum that 
hooks together right here. I was going to build this whole carriage piece, this whole uh, carrier for the Z-axis. I found it on for sale on Amazon and it was literally like $25 more expensive than what it would cost me to build it. And it came pre-assembled. It was awesome. So those are just the main functioning parts of the machine. Then we're going to move on to the spindle. My spindle is a 2.2 kilowatt air-cooled uh, spindle. 2.2 kilowatts roughly translates into 3 horsepower. Way overkill for what I need, but it'll cut just about anything I want. This thing will go up to 24,000 RPMs. And I ordered this off of Amazon. I want to say this one, I almost even remember the name of the company. I think it was Rat Motors, but I'll, I'll leave a link just so to be sure so you can go through and look at what I've got. Uh, the mount came with it, which was awesome. It mounted straight to this carrier here that I ordered, and it fit up perfect. The only thing I, you can notice I've had a problem with, this one bolt here, it, I don't know if it's a little cross-threaded up on when they made it or what, but it will not go in. It doesn't matter the top and bottom one go in and hold that thing really snug. So I didn't worry much about that, and honestly, that's going to do the job. You can see some pieces that I've added to it. I'll show you right here uh, on the back of it. This cross member, this cross member, and this cross member. I added those so I could add a gusset on each side, and that's just half inch plywood gusset. I'm not real sure I needed it, but I didn't want the router flexing as it cut into things. I'll walk around here to the back side, and you can see my setup here. This again is half inch aluminum plate. You can see where all the little linear glides hook in. Four bolts on each one. And so there are four linear glides here. One here, 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 and here. In the middle, those four bolts are the ones that go to the glide that goes on the ball screw. Right here you can see some plate steel. And right up there you can see another piece of plate steel. It's about five inches wide. That is a 90 degree that I welded up. That's what hooks in to the back of this cross member. And I mean, it works like a dream. It's held the, my tolerance is pretty tight. I'm gonna show you right there how close I am to my railing, but it stays right there the entire time. I mean, it's got, it's worked perfectly as it glides. The next thing I'm going to look at here is wiring. That's what's in all this sheathing right here like this that's silver. Uh, I did a little overkill on it too. Being that this router, this air-cooled router, is a 220 volt, I went ahead and used 12 aught wire. I mean that's some pretty good size wire. But all four wires that go to the spindle are 12 aught. So I don't have to worry about the wire melting down. After I got everything wired on this machine, the uh, my motors right here, my router, I got that all wired up and I run across an article talking about RFI ground looping, which is radio frequency interference caused by the wires that send it all this, these transmissions back and forth and it just causes the router will be zipping along and all of a sudden just go haywire and just go whichever way it wants to go. So instead of worrying about running into that problem I chose to go ahead and just get some shielding and alleviate it before it started so right here this is a copper tin mesh and it caught I bought about 50 feet of it I want to say it cost me about 75 to 80 dollars uh, again I'll leave another link to that I don't I got it off Amazon I don't remember the name of any of these companies but uh, it's worked great. It, I have no problems with any RFI. Don't know if I would have beforehand, but I really didn't want to find out the hard way that I was going to have some real issues. Okay, this one goes to run the spindle itself. This one goes to run the little stepper motor on top. You can see them come back. The way I have them set up is I got them put through a piece of PVC that hook into a spring that I've got attached to the ceiling. And I've got enough slack that it doesn't yet touch the table, but 
I can go all the way to the end of my table and it still won't get tight. And even if it does start to get tight, my spring will give a little bit so I don't have any problems with my wires getting in the way. My other one over here, where you see it, this one moves constantly. I mean, as the gantry moves up that way or back, this wire has to be free flowing. This one was very simple. I just took a simple zip tie, tied it to this so it's good and tight. And it just runs down here to my box. I've got plenty of extra room and it can just sit, sit here and swing back and forth. That's worked great for me. Uh, as you guys can see, I mean, this isn't, is it near what a factory machine would look like? You can see welds on this one. You can see that I've uh, primered the whole thing and never painted it. It's just gray. And that works out fine. It covered, it, it's not rusting on me. So the other thing I did not point out down here on this end, when I was building this, this is two inch angle iron. And you can see a piece here, a piece here. I just extended it out to the back. I built my own brackets out of one eighth inch plate. This plate, I just basically welded it up, measured my holes, four holes in it, put me a couple little gussets over on the side, and that thing's rock solid. They don't move at all. As long as you're perfectly lined up down your rails, uh, your ball screw, great. I mean, perfect. I mean, I'll walk over here and look at the other side, but there's really not a lot different. It's the same setup. The only difference is on this end, we got a pillow block here on the x-axis. Works just like the other pillow blocks. So that's pretty much the actual machine itself. So now we'll look at a couple other extra things. So one thing I haven't seen on any other machine, I, but I haven't been around just a bunch of them is I put an air box on mine. This was just a little tube tie-in. I initially thought I was going to take this, put me a piece of pipe, and run straight up through the ceiling, which I have lined with plywood. And I was just going to pull air out of the attic. But after I got to thinking about it, I put a household filter in it that would go in your central heat and air. It's a 14 by 14. It just lays on top of that, and inside I have a little $10 fan from Walmart that I plug in right over there. I, it's turned on all the time, and it forces air down this ducting. This is regular old uh, dryer ducting. It forces air to my computer, and it forces air over to my electronics. Now, as you can see on my electronics box and the air ducting box, I've got some nice... My connectors here are quarter inch plywood that I've made the holes and made them fit all nice and pretty. I never made it quite that far over here on the computer. I plan to. I mean, I am going to change that up. I'm going to make it like the rest of it so it'll hold secure. But right now, a piece of cardboard and some masking tape is what that one's got. We're talking about my computer stand here. I built this computer stand. Uh, it's MDF. It's got some plywood plywood walls. I got some uh, one by four pine framed out a door. Simple little clamps to hold it. Inside you can see I've got a 32-bit tower and you heard me right 32-bit. The software that runs the actual CNC is 32-bit. It's called Mop 3. It had me floor 2. My software to program this stuff is 64-bit. And so I put it on a fire stick, a memory stick, bring it out here and plug it into this machine, and then I cut whatever I need. I do all my software graphics in the house, but I could not believe it was 32-bit. It's This technology's been around for a while, and so back then, I mean, that was kind of the big computer and works great. I bought my computer. I didn't have one laying around that was a 32-bit, so I bought it off eBay. I paid ninety dollars for that thing, and it's just a refurbished, and that's all this machine's used for is for my CNC. Over here beside it, you see a fan. That is the duct fan for whenever the computer is turned on. It pulls air in from that box that I showed you, so it gets clean air. Up here, you have my exhaust fan, 
which is the same way I turn the computer on, it kicks on. Right beside it's the inverter for the spindle. This is a 220 volt inverter for the 2.2 kilowatt spindle I have up there. And you can see the mess of wiring that goes in and out of that thing. I mean, I'm not going to get into all the wiring schematics and stuff. That stuff is readily available on the internet. Uh, that's where I found it all, is I just got on the internet and searched, went to blogs, and found all my wiring schematics. I mean, right now, off the top of my head, I probably couldn't walk you back through that without tearing everything apart and seeing where I've got it plugged in. And right now, I'm not really willing to do that because that's just, that, it takes a lot of time. I mean, this build took me 10 months start to finish. And in fairness, I worked five days a week while I was doing the build. So I really only worked on it two, maybe two and a half, three days a week. Sometimes, some weekends, I wouldn't get to work on it at all, simply because I'd ordered parts and it took 10 days for the parts to get here. 90% of these parts came from China. Even though I ordered them off Amazon, China is who is manufacturing them. It's coming straight from those companies. So I just had to wait. So next, we're going to run right over here to this box that you see underneath my table. This is the brains of the system uh, outside the computer. This is where all the electronics gets hooked up. And let me get under there and we'll take a look in that box. Okay. So right back there on the far back, let's see if I can zoom in a little bit for you. That back there, that black thing right there is my intake fan coming from that fan box. These four black things right here, those are all drivers that run each of the stepper motors. Back a little bit more, and you'll see I have four power sources. All four of those silver boxes are power sources. And each one runs a driver. Then all the wiring comes down and comes down to what I really consider to be kind of the brains of the system. That is a breakout board. That electronics board you see right there is called a breakout board. That is where all the wires go. It feeds all the information the drivers are needing to do. It comes out into an old parallel port that you used to run your printers with on the older machines and it runs over and ties in to the back of my computer. That's just the way this system works. I mean it's it's an old enough technology that it still uses the the whatever it is the 18 or 21 pin parallel port. Works great. Now finding some of that stuff is harder to do. You can find the the parallel port wires I mean, I ordered mine off of eBay when I ordered my uh, computer, my older computer here. And I mean, even, even though it's older technology, it's working great. I'm going to show you one or two other little things here. I mean, you can see I have power strips hooked up to the end of my box. That is just for simplicity for me. These bigger blocks right there, those are to run your fans. One, the exhaust fan that's right here, and then the one that's coming in. Uh, that's all those are for. And I'm sure you saw the silver blocks I was talking about that are the power sources. Yeah, that's probably overkill. I probably don't need a power source for every driver. I probably could have got away with two, maybe even one of them. Those things are 60 volt. But my theory was they sent me all these drivers and a power source for each. I went ahead and used them because if, for some reason, this motor right here quits, I've got it isolated. I know it's either the motor, the driver, or the power source. It's got to be one of the three. And so I can quickly just go through and troubleshoot. That is probably the biggest drive I had behind this build was the troubleshooting side of it. I built it. If something breaks, I know how to fix it. That's the beauty of this thing. So. I'm going to show you one more thing that's very important that I've got on here. This is an emergency cutoff switch. This hooks into that breakout board I showed you. It's wired in in such a way that if the machine goes haywire, starts doing whatever, going crazy, and I'm at this end of the table, which I consider this to be the, the, op, the I consider that to be the head end, whatever you want to call this end from that, up to you. But I call, 
I put this emergency stop switch in here. If something goes wrong, I just hit it, it stops all motion on the machine. Definitely recommend putting in one of those. Something I am going to say that uh, real dedicated CNCers are going to notice that I haven't pointed out is limit switches. Limit switches go like right here on the end of a rail at the opposite end and there's probably mm, two, four, six, probably six or eight limit switches that need to be on this thing. That way if something does go wrong with the machine it just won't slide right off into the floor and it could. That's why whenever I'm running it I'm here with it. I'm always sitting here watching it. I know the parameters it's supposed to be following. If it goes beyond that, I just stop it and I start looking at what it's doing. Um, I'm still fairly new to this, but that part of it, I'm not real worried about. I'm not worried about my programming side of it. I'm pretty familiar with it. But uh, at some point, yes, I'm going to add the limit switches. Okay, guys, that's basically the overview of this machine. Uh, I hope I. I covered most everything. I didn't get real technical in any part of it, but I mean, I explained each part to the best of my ability, I think, to help you understand what each one does. Uh, like I said, I'm going to leave links for all the components down below so you can run over there and see where I bought them and see what they cost. I mean, I can give you some basic ideas. I do believe the ball screw that's five foot long cost about $80 a piece. There's three of them on this machine. Uh, the linear rails, I really don't remember how much those cost. I do know my spindle and inverter cost somewhere between $350 and $400. Uh, the little carriage that the spindle is hooked to, that cost about $250 to $275. It was right in there somewhere. And I mean, I just, it's been long enough ago that I bought this stuff, I don't remember all the prices right off the top of my head. But, uh, Hopefully I can put enough in the description that you can go and get enough knowledge if this is something you want to do. Roughly over the whole project, I have about $3,200 in this. The reason I chose to build it is two reasons. One, I've got $3,200 in this. Uh, to go buy one this size, the cheapest one I found that's a factory built machine is $12,000 and it's nowhere near as beefy as my machine. It does not have the components mine has. Uh, to get one with the components of my size, you're probably looking at somewhere twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars, which big difference. Especially since I'm just starting out with this, didn't know if this was something that I was going to continue to do for a long time or not. I mean, I was just playing with it at first, but now that I've got it going, I love it. Uh, I'm not, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to deter you from doing a uh, industrial built machine great. My second reason that I did this though was that I built the machine. If it breaks, any part of it breaks, I know how to put it back together. You give me an industrial built machine, I'm probably not going to be able to track it down real quick. And even if I do track it down, I may not know the best way to fix it because I don't know exactly how that whole thing's put together. That's one of my biggest reasons for building it. And now then, I wouldn't be afraid of an industrial machine now because I understand the workings of it. But biggest point, man, I, if this is something you're interested in doing, just go out and try it. Man, it, it was a good time putting it together. I mean, I really enjoyed this kind of challenge, and I'll be fair to you. I'm a little bit of a computer nerd. That was my major in college, and I was a computer programmer. I did computer science in college. So the computer side of it was not trying, real trying on me. I understand most of it. Uh, the software I use in the house that I did the other the programming on the other day, that is called Vectric VCarve Pro. And just an example, that program is $700. The sad side of it is not the program I want. The program I want is Vectric VCarve uh, Aspire. It's a $2,000 program and it will do leaps and bounds more. I'm striving to get there and I hope to do it because it will allow me to do some straight 3D stuff. I mean, you can do a person's face out of wood. It's unbelievable what that will do. And I'm hoping we'll get there shortly. I feel like I'm just rambling on now, guys. If you have any questions, just shoot them in the comments. And I'll try to leave all, everything I can down in the descriptions. Like I said, just kind of watch the video. During the video, I'm hoping that I'll put in plenty of pictures for you to understand the build itself. And that's all I've got this time, guys. If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe. And I'll see you all next time.